Hello and welcome to Hire Automation, a podcast brought to you by High Robotics. I'm your host, Michelle Dawn Mooney. Today, we're talking about how to automate your warehouse for fast ROI. Who doesn't want fast ROI, right? Many businesses want robotic automation for their warehouses, but understanding, achieving, and then proving ROI for these systems, technologies, can be challenging. So in this installment of Higher Automation, we explore how to boost and accelerate ROI on your warehouse automation with Scott Eggenberger, who is a director of business development at ETI Material Handling, and Will McGinnis, who is technical sales executive at High Robotics. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Michelle. Yeah, pleasure to be here. It's going to be a great conversation. Before we dive in, can I ask both of you for a brief bio? Maybe, Scott, starting with you. Sure. I'm Scott Eggenberger with ETI. So I've got uh, 20 plus years in the supply chain space, um, spanning everything from uh, equipment sales, forklifts, to uh, WMS software implementations. Um, Now, with the last six years with ETI, we're a material handling integrator. So we help folks to... uh, to evaluate, select, and implement technology that's going to make their distribution operation more effective. Perfect. And Will, you're a familiar face, but can you give us a a bio as well? Yeah, Michelle, maybe not so familiar now that the uh, mustache is back by popular (laughs) demand. Uh, Highly mixed results, by the way, in case you're wondering. (laughs) We we can uh, take a quota survey at the end. We'll that sounds fantastic. Got. Yeah, leave some comments <laughs> and uh, some feedback would be uh, greatly appreciated. You, uh, you know, I've been in the material handling space with High Robotics for about a year now, a little over a year. So I don't quite have the same wealth of experience that uh, that Scott's got over there on the other end of the line. But uh, he's been showing me the ropes and, you know, working with great partners like ETI. I've been getting up to speed pretty quickly here, but loving the industry and planning on staying here for the long haul. All right. So we're excited to have people stay for the long haul of the podcast, excited to get into this conversation. So let's start off with this little bit of a foundational question, I guess. Can you start us off by providing some context about the current landscape of warehouse automation and ASRS technology? Yeah, so um, Michelle, what we're seeing is right now the market, it's a brisk market. Um, There's a high level of interest from end users. Um, There's lots of players in the marketplace, uh, lots of different approaches. Um, But I think at a a high level, um, I think everybody realizes that it's it's the future, right? That they're going to have to, some sort of automation is going to be the cost of entry to be competitive going forward. Um, everybody's competing for the same limited labor market um, and trying to, to you know, be effective, um, rely on labor less and, and have the labor that they do have, um, giving them better results and better return. And um, then you've got raised customer expectations, you know, the, um, the Amazon effect um, where people just cust- end, end recipients have a higher expectation for how fast something's going to be picked, packed, and shipped. And, you know, if they click on it today, they want it at their doorstep tomorrow. Completely agreed. And, you know, just to piggyback off of Scott's point there, uh, the expectation uh, is spanning essentially every industry uh, for what the new expectation is for uh, fulfillment time and delivery and quality and assurance that everything is getting where it needs to go. Uh, in the appropriate manner. So uh, not just are we seeing that, you know, with your Amazons and other uh, e-commerce retailers, but it's spanning the gauntlet from pharmaceutical to manufacturing spare part fulfillments to cosmetics. Uh, there's really there's really no uh, particular vertical that we've seen that couldn't stand to benefit from some sort of automation in their distribution facilities and, of course, specifically in their automated storage and retrieval systems. Yeah, and if you think about it, Will, you see, you know, how many, uh, how many packages do you get on your doorstep every day compared to two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? I mean, it's just – it's become part of the landscape, Right. People want the convenience of being able to click and pay from home and and just have that box show up on their doorstep. So I don't think it's going away. And, uh, you know, it's automation is going to be, you know, almost a requirement to be to be competitive. And, you know, speaking from the millennial side of things, I was at the grocery store the other day. I was looking to pick up some toothpaste. I knew that I needed it. 
Um, but rather than actual actually buy it from the brick and mortar, I opt to just purchase it online because that's what I've been used to. I like all the options that there are. So, uh, you know, we're, we're living in an environment where that's slowly becoming 50% of all consumables that are being bought in a, uh, you know, by the end users uh, for, for these different companies. So uh, it's, there's only one way to embrace it, and that's by better automating it and making sure that, you know, they're up to speed with the new the latest and greatest technology. Uh, and, and we boomers are right there with you millennials, Will. And I just bought some dishwashing detergent online as well. So I am right in the mix. So I have a feeling that we're going to talk about that. What I like to think of as that fast food mentality. We want something. We want it right away. I think that's going to come up in the answer for this question, but curious to see what else you have to say. You know, many businesses, of course, are facing challenges in really understanding and then, of course, achieving ROI with warehouse automation. So what are some common obstacles that you have observed? And then how can the integration of ASRS technology really address these challenges? Yeah, Michelle, you know, I'll, I'll kick it off and start the conversation by just addressing the labor market. You know, we had touched on it on the first point, but that's that's really the number one benefit that a, a automated or semi-automated ASRS system is going to bring. So when you're looking at addressing just the, the ROI and what sort of recurring expenses that you have to address, there's a lot of different buckets that we'll get into later on in the conversation. Uh, but far and away, the biggest one that all these companies are considering is just decreasing the amount of recurring expenses. Expenses uh, that are seen through the workforce. So, uh, again, a couple of different ways that you can tackle it. Uh, you can have, you know, a fully manual approach. You can have a person to goods sort of system, or a, a goods to person, where you're essentially uh, paying a little bit more upfront for on a capex standpoint, uh, but really reaping the benefits of minimizing your recurring expenses as much as possible. So. Um, you know, there's a couple of means that we analyze and, and check to see what's going to make the most sense for the end customer. Uh, but generally speaking, there's so many factors that could potentially impact kind of the end diagnosis from the SKU profile. So what sort of weights and dims you're working with, uh, how many different SKUs it is that you're managing in the facility, uh, perhaps, you know, what sort of cases or totes or storage receptacles everything is getting placed into. If you're putting everything on a high bay pallet racking or if you are breaking it up into individual case sizes uh, and storing that in your distribution centers. Uh, and then, of course, the layout itself. You know, does it make sense to stay in your existing facility and try to optimize the space, consolidate all the storage a little bit more? Or are you in a position where it makes more sense to go to a greenfield, uh, look into getting a new building and starting from scratch. So, uh, you know, we, we really try to make sure that, you know, when we're working with end customers uh, and everybody in the industry is is keeping all these things in mind and factored in so that, you know, you're you're figuring out the best possible solution and what's going to achieve the most sensible ROI uh, and on a case by case basis. Yeah, well, well put, Will. I, I agree with everything you said. And, and I'll add that, you know, one thing that we see is, People are going higher, right? Um, you know, when you're when you're leasing or buying space, you know, you're paying for that footprint. So the cost is really in how big of a, a piece, you know, how big of a piece of land your warehouse is going to be on, what the square footage is. Um, but the ability to to go further up in the air is um, is a, a much lower incremental cost than go, than spreading out. Um, also, it becomes more efficient. You know, you reduce you reduce horizontal travel. So, um, so I absolutely agree with you that you know those are um, uh, people are looking to to kind of shrink down their facilities uh, and be able to do more in, in less space. Um, and, and I, you know, when I looked at this question, I, I read it a little differently than you did. And I, I see, Will, you are um, the better reader than me. But um, you know, some of the I think some of the challenges people have have found when they're when they're looking at technology um, you know potentially an excessive focus on one metric or one area of improvement um, and not looking at it as a as a holistic system so that's um that's one of the things that that we see a lot is people obsess about 
you know, they want to fix this or they want to fix that, and they don't look at the whole the system as a whole. Completely agree. Sometimes you're at a trade show, you see the new shiny toy, and you want to figure out how to throw that in your facility as quickly as possible. Um, but taking a step back and really diagnosing the uh, the low hanging fruit and the the biggest areas of concern that you could come in and quickly find uh, a nice return on investment always seems to be the better approach. Yeah, and and, and we find that you know folks are um, uh, you know one piece of equipment or one piece of automation can be the, the most efficient and give you the greatest um, throughput, but it's not an island, right? You still have to get product to it. You have to get product from it. You have to be efficient in your use of consumables. So all of that kind of ties into um, looking at it as, as a as a whole system as opposed to individual pieces of automation. Agreed. And, and you know, Scott, taking a step back to uh, just to speak on that verticality piece, um, I've noticed a lot of individuals, it seems like the answer when you're upgrading your distribution center is always to investigate going to a new building and just, you know, picking up and shifting everything and, and starting from scratch. It's certainly an option that might make a sense for a lot of end customers in a lot of scenarios. Um, but it is it is nice to see that a lot of the existing facilities that we're going into uh, might have up to 40 feet of clear height, and they're utilizing systems where they're only really using 10 feet or so of racking that they're storing case by case systems in. So um, definitely one piece that you can always consider. Um, you know, maybe it's tougher to expand out horizontally, uh, but we found in in a lot of the projects that we've been working on lately, there's almost always room to go up. Yeah, and that's a great point in terms of, of ROI as well. You know, that's something people overlook. If you can, you know, you you might be focused on headcount or, you know, shipping savings, but if you can um, eliminate or defer your need to move to a bigger facility, um, that's well, that's money that goes straight to the bottom line, right? If you can um, make do with the, the space you have or or work with a reduced space. Yeah, I know, you know, Scott, you said even from a time standpoint, you know, it eliminating the need to go farther, you know, horizontally and, and going up would obviously same time there. But to your point, you know, with real estate rates and interest rates where they are right now, huge savings if you do not have to find a new space or a bigger space there. So as we've already touched on, there are a lot of different things that kind of go into our major topic at hand there. There's not one magic formula to fast ROI, but overall, you really do want to reduce or, you know, eliminate touch points where human labor is needed to connect one process to another. So what are some strategies that we can consider in this area? So um, first and foremost, I think, uh, you know, just like I've, like I've said a couple of times, focus on a holistic system on, you know, not just individual pieces of automation or equipment, but on a system that efficiently moves product through your distribution center and to your customers. You know, our philosophy is really in any distribution operation, the, the three things that make you money are picking, packing, and shipping. Those are your profit centers. Everything else you do, receiving, put away, cycle counting, um, you know, those are all essentially necessary expenses that go with that you have to do in order to position yourselves to do to do the things that make you money. Um, but you know, in terms of ROI, I think a good place to start is you know we go into a facility and we look at horizontal travel. So that's that's the enemy of efficiency, right? If you're if you're traveling, that's just that's not value added. Um, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, it tires your folks out, and it doesn't really add any value. So we look to eliminate horizontal travel. Um, we look to eliminate touches. So, you know, we had a, a project we did for a client um, where we eliminated a, a couple of touches for every piece of, of uh, product that went through the building. And so that let, you know, that added up pretty quick. And then the third thing, um, and, you know, it doesn't really apply to, to ASRS, but don't overlook shipping savings. Um, that's typically where you know the biggest line item of expenses in the in a DC. It's typically the you know the biggest volume. So if you can right size your packaging, minimize or eliminate void fill, um, capture outbound weights and dimensions so that you can have in you know information to intelligently audit and 
and question your freight bills. Um, you know, we did a, we're in the middle of doing a concept for a high volume fulfillment operation. And, you know, we're estimating a, a really relatively small, you know, a few percent savings in, in freight costs by, by cubing and putting everything in a smaller box. But it adds up to, you know, over a million dollars a year um, just because of the volume, you know. So even at, you know, 48, 50 cents per, uh, um, per shipment, you know, there's, there's a ton of, of savings there. And, and that's typically something that uh, something people overlook. You know, even if it's small incrementally, it adds up over time and it'll fund a lot of other projects or a lot of other um, automation that you want to do as part of the project. Um, Will, over to you, my man. Scott, yeah. I mean, you teed it up for me nicely. I think uh, those are some fantastic points that you made. Obviously, holistically, you want to keep in mind the entirety of the end-to-end solution. It's something that I can start to lose track of, of course, being boxed in just on the ASRS side. But when we're working with end customers and you know integrators, uh, we would always recommend that you know really you should check to see what the lowest hanging fruit is and see how you can you know best improve the system incrementally. So um, you know it's something that you know we would offer specifically on the ASRS side um, or any other robotics company for that matter. Um, but you know you should always keep in mind that it doesn't have to be super capex intensive upfront automatically, where you're making all these improvements and investing in these new technologies, and all the payment has to occur within you know six months to a year. Uh, we always feel like the the best approach is to figure out where you're going to get the best bang for your buck early on, uh, improve that, and then look to see how you can incorporate that in to a larger solution. You know, over a three to five year plan or so. Uh, that said, we feel like there's always great savings on the ASRS side of things. Uh, anecdotally, from what we have seen kind of on implementations on, in the field and proposals that we're running through and simulating currently, uh, generally speaking, you'll find roughly a two to three year RO, ROI when you're fully automating an ASRS solution. Uh, but again, it's important to consider you know, where, you can, where you can find those savings wherever possible. Yeah, and I think when we talked earlier, and and you know we all we recently co-published a a fulfillment concept, um, and that that two to three years, that's simply labor on the on the picking side, right? So you know that pays for for a good chunk of the investment and in a reasonable amount of time, but then like on the on the concept we put out, um, you're going to be you know under two years when you add in being able to to ship out of a smaller building automating the packaging, the freight savings, you know, all the other items that, that add up into that, um, you know, it's a, it's a very quick ROI. And then, you know, keep in mind, too, there are companies out there that will lease or, you know, finance your equipment. So you don't have, it doesn't have to be a big capital investment. You know, if you can, if you can do something where you're paying as you go, um, you know, typically you can be in the black from day one on a project like this. Um, you know, and your savings are essentially paying for the automation over time. So, Scott, let's talk about that, because I'm glad you brought up that timeline. Beyond the initial deployment, how does ASRS technology contribute to long-term value for business? Maybe, Will, you want to start us off here? Yeah, I'll, I'll happy to kick that one off, Michelle. Um, you know, in general, uh, the, uh, the most obvious one, and, you know, I'm trying not to beat a dead horse to death here, but with ASRS, it's that reduction of labor. So something that might originally take 25 employees to go and fulfill kind of all the, the picking and packing operation, uh, you know, once you add these automated systems in, may take seven, uh, possibly even six. But um, that's, that's going to be your number one benefit when you're looking to incorporate any sort of you know, automated storage retrieval system. Aside from just the labor savings, there are some other intangibles that are a little bit more difficult to quantify from an ROI perspective, and that really being the, the process consistency and repeatability that you would see in, in a new system once you start automating things. So uh, while there's a lot of room for error for individual operators, to uh, to incorrectly pick certain goods or, or perhaps you know place things in a package that it shouldn't be placed in, uh, one of the big benefits of of kind of bringing that automation and having that WES brought to the landscape and tying things into you know any sort of warehouse management system is the ability to have that sort of redundancy and ensure that everything is being processed the way that it should. 
Um, to expand on that point a little bit more, the inventory tracking that you're bringing to the table is also a, a critical aspect of making sure that your ongoing operations are running smoothly. Uh, and that's something that doesn't need a huge investment. You know, you could have kind of a more automated inventory tracking system uh, simply from just having a manual uh, sort of setup. Uh, you could do that from having a you know a goods to person sort of approach, but we find that when you marriage that increased uh, warehouse execution system and inventory tracking uh, along with that automated storage and retrieval, uh, then you're then you're really going to have the most repeatable, reliable process to picking and packaging that you can achieve. Yeah. Well, and a and a well engineered system will is going to is going to provide some checks and balances, right? I mean, if you have some sort of a weight and dimension capture on the outbound, you know, a scan to uh, as your as your boxing uh, product a shipment, um, weight and dimension capture on the outbound with some sort of a a, a kickoff if you're out of uh, you know if, if you're out of spec, um, those kind of things are inexpensive to relatively inexpensive to build into the system, and you know then you don't have to manually double check and you reduce your errors. And, you, you know, so there it eliminates a lot of uh, a lot of pain down the road. Um, but, but I'll also add, you know, when you're talking about what ASRS contributes, it certainly provides an infrastructure for efficiency, um, but also it provides scalability. Right. I mean, we are, you know, for our customers that are in growth mode, um, we like to design the system to fulfill, um, you know, to fulfill their volume on a single shift and then. You know, whereas sometimes it's easier to show an ROI if you're running, if you're leveraging your investment across two shifts, um, if you if you engineer it for a single shift, then you can double your productivity by just adding a second shift. So it's it's really scalable. Um, and a couple of other things not to overlook for for ASRS systems, you know, much quicker, higher to productivity. Right, you bring somebody on board. Um, there's not that much to show them. It's not that complicated. They're not traveling. There's not a lot of tribal knowledge. They don't need to know what's where. They don't need to know what products look like. The system's guiding them. And, and, you know, from there, they're more efficient. So you reduce your turnover, your HR costs, um, all the costs associated with with employee turnover and managing your workforce. It couldn't agree more there, Scott. And, and it's a great point on the scalability piece and, um, you know, making sure that the tribal knowledge is getting passed along. Uh, in today's modern fleet management systems, uh, Adding a lot of these robots, it really is as simple as adding a few more bots uh, to a certain grid if you need to increase that throughput. So really keeps it straightforward for you. Yep. So this all sounds good, but let's talk about some results because the proof is in the pudding, right? So can you share some success stories where companies have not only achieved impressive initial ROI, but then also continue to reap benefits over time, which is something that, of course, we would like to see extended, right? It, absolutely, and I, I'll start with this one and give some general industry uh, examples, and then maybe Will, you can you can jump into some more high specific uh, uh, answers. But um, so we have a, a customer, um, a cosmetics distributor, and kind of a um, kind of a unique uh, um, operation in that they have a relatively small number of SKUs, and everything's physically small. So some advantages to, to being able to pick. Um, so we put in a system, um, gosh, seven or eight years ago, that would be considered ancient technology today, but it's, they still have some of the fastest pick rates around. Um, they're, they're able to fulfill, you know, 10,000 or more orders out of a relatively small distribution center um, with a really, really high level of accuracy. So they've been a, um, a success story um, from from day one, essentially, just being able to, uh, to, in terms of throughput and accuracy um, on their fulfillment operation. Um, another more recent client that we did a project with this year, um, they have two, they're a 3PL and they have two product lines for a, a specific customer and they were running them through the same uh, outbound process. So they had a, you know, a, a, um, a automated case sealer and a print and apply, a top label print and apply and um, everything was set to uh, to one height. So the second product line, which was much smaller than the first, they were putting in oversized boxes and shipping, you know, paying their customers paying out the nose in um, in shipping rates. 
So we were able to to do a, an adjustable print and apply and, and give them a second outbound line and a side apply, a side apply for the print and apply and an adjustable case sealer. And, um, you know, they're able to, to ship a, a variety of different size boxes and ship a lot less cubic volume to, uh, um, to this customer of theirs. Um, another project we did last year, um, we helped a client. They, uh, they moved their pick operation from they had this huge um, two-level pick module uh, that they were running five days a week, and it was a what we call a bucket brigade, a pick and pass, and we gave them a more efficient pick operation, and they were able to take uh, you know a two-level, 15,000-square-foot operation at, on two levels, so 30 total, and put it all in less than 10,000 square feet and, um, do, and reduce their picking days from five a week to four. So, you know, they, they took 20% out of their picking labor. And in their case, their, um, their building was a manufacturing building as well as a distribution operation. So they were able to give some space back to manufacturing that they desperately needed and, and delay the need for extra space, like we, we talked about earlier. Um, the fourth one, you know, we had a, a footwear company that we did a project for a couple of years ago. Um, and that project included an automated uh, uh, carton builder. So they would just, one of the, the systems where you just put the, the outbound shipment on a conveyor belt and it, it wraps a box around it with no void fill and no wasted space. And, you know, our customer was skeptical about that and they were really kind of nervous about the automation. Um, but in the end, you know, they're saving seven figures a year in shipping costs wow. um, just from, from running volume through that and, and, Eliminating the, uh, you know, eliminating the need for void fill and, and shrinking down how much, how much cubic volume they ship out of that facility. So, um, you know, there's there's plenty of uh, of examples where the ROI pays for years to come. Um, Will and I'll, I'll turn it over to you because I'm sure you have some specific examples as well. Yeah, and, and you know, it's it's crazy how expensive that empty space can get. When you uh, when you're starting to take a deeper dive at the void fill aspect of things, um, you know, Scott, I, obviously you're you're kind of the guy that provides the wealth of knowledge. So I'll keep my anecdotes short on my end, having only been in the industry for a year now. But uh, you know, I know we're working with some internationally recognized apparel and footwear companies, uh, you know, both overseas and here in the U.S. And just looking at some of the labor savings that we're seeing, I mean, we're at the magnitude if you're really kind of automating the inbound process. So getting product into totes and putting it into storage and automating, you know, more so on the outbound where, um, you know, perhaps you have some sort of robotic arm or you just have a better means of sorting uh, individual piece items to, uh, to that end order and sending it off to packaging in a, you know, more systematic fashion. Uh, we'll see labor savings up to 80% on our end. And we're talking about facilities that originally would have, you know, up to 200 employees working at them. So especially in kind of that 3PL footwear space that Scott had uh, touched on, on one of his examples, uh, there you can really start to carve away at the recurring costs uh, that, that you might find at, you know, really any distribution center. Uh, the other piece that I would noticed, we're working with, uh, you know, one of the top three global retailers uh, in the world here, and they, uh, we found that more so than just the ROI side of things and uh, cutting costs and just kind of improving uh, their supply chain with a more robust system, uh, it's really formed into more of a marketing play for some of these larger companies where, you know, again, not just are they getting those savings, but they're using that as a piece to position themselves as a, a forward-thinking company that's willing to put that upfront investment in and take the next step towards, uh, you know, becoming the the market leader in, uh, you know, whatever sort of uh, industry it is that they're a part of. So uh, that's been a great aspect of things that I was unaware of. You know, to me, just with the supply chain background, it's always about cutting down and getting the getting to the bottom line and saving money as much as possible. But it's interesting that you can use that technology to also uh, leverage your ability to increase your top line growth and really use it as a strong marketing tool. And, and Will, one thing to add, um, as you were as you were kind of going through your part of it, with ASRS technology specifically, um, and specifically apparel and footwear, you know, we were all keenly aware of those customers that go online 
and they click, you know, a half the size up and then the size they think they are, or whatever that is. And, or, or, you know, they buy something in two sizes or two colors and those go out and you know, one of them's coming back. Right. Um, so uh, I didn't want to say anything, Michelle, but I had you you for it. Um, Guilty. You know, and, and those come back in, in their, you know, their, the product's in perfect shape. It can go right back in the inventory. But an ASRS is a great application for processing returns and putting it into a forward pick environment because that, uh, that return, if it's resellable, you know, by definition, it's going to be the oldest product in your warehouse because it was the oldest product when we shipped it to Michelle. Um, and then, you know, so when it comes back, it's definitely the oldest. So that's going to be the first thing out the door. So, you know, having a forward pick area where you can quickly and efficiently process your returns and then, um, you know, ship them right out. Um, that's a great application for a, 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 an ASR, a product like Hi. It's a fantastic call out there too, Scott, because that's another piece where you don't really consider those variables when you're looking at the total ROI. Um, but I know, you know, those those products being unreusable and, and kind of failing a manual sort of inspection or passing a manual inspection when it shouldn't is another huge piece eating into the cost of of these distribution centers and companies. Um, whereas, you know, if you're automating it and, and you're able to pass through those labor intensive checks, uh, it's just one more means of saving money. So we've covered a lot of territory here. Any final thoughts as we're wrapping up? Some great information. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions. Maybe we would like some additional resources. Where can they go to have some of those questions answered? So we've recently, um, ETI and HI jointly have recently published a concept. And it's a, um, it's a footwork concept, um, fulfillment concept. But it just, it, it sort of shows how, you know, what, how what we've been talking about would work in the real world. Where if you, if you have the right, pieces of automation and equipment and you tie them together well, you get a very efficient operation. And of course, you know, nobody who's watching this podcast is going to say that's a perfect exact match for me, but it's a great place to start. You know, we spell out all the savings and where the benefits are. So uh, I'm sure that, that the link will be up with this uh, at the end of this podcast and people will be able to, to take a look at that. But that's, that's a great kind of, option to to look at and say how does how would this apply to me and then obviously we're happy to have more detailed conversations around somebody's you know specific operation and metrics and products and order profile and all those kind of things that come into play. And, you know, I would say if, if you're an end customer that potentially could benefit from this white paper solution, this fulfillment in a box, uh, or if you're just somebody like me who maybe is a little bit more ignorant on the full end-to-end -end process of things and various means that a distribution center can end up uh, saving more money and, and achieving a greater ROI – um, through all these different technologies, I would say it's worthwhile to check it out. So uh, if you download a copy, you, you, you take a look at it, or if you have any other questions from anything that Scott and I had discussed and want to have some, want to learn some more information, uh, you can always feel free to reach out to either of us at our emails. Um, mine is will.mcinnis at highrobotics.com and you know, happy to discuss anything in more detail. Scott Eggenberger, Director of Business Development at ETI Material Handling Integrators and Will McGinnis, Technical Sales Executive at High Robotics. I want to thank both of you for joining me today. Really appreciate your time. Great conversation and excited to see where the future is taking things with ASRS technology. So thank you for being here today. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate you having us. Always a pleasure, Michelle. Thanks again. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Higher Automation. And of course, you can visit both Scott and Will's websites, etintegrators.com, and then of course, highrobotics.com. And we would love for you to subscribe to the Higher Automation podcast as well to hear more great conversations like the one you heard today. I'm your host, Michelle Don Mooney. Once again, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you on another podcast soon. Mm -hmm.